The story of Charles Ives is that of a brilliantly original composer who lived quite literally years ahead of his time in almost every way possible. Ives was a maverick American experimentalist at a time when to be considered a professional musician in the United States called for a European pedigree in training if not in heritage and a decidedly conservative musical outlook. Neither much suited the Connecticut Yankee whose musical predilections foreshadowing what avant-garde methods the rest of the world was to discover decades later ran to microtonality, polymusics, tone clusters, and aleatory methods. He sought above all not to blandly replicate the European art music tradition, but to meld it with the sounds of traditional American music, the kind he'd come to know so well from his upbringing and his family life. And to do this, to remain as true as possible to this unprecedented aesthetic that guided his every musical conception, he was forced to adopt a lifestyle that on the surface at least did not resemble that of a musician, professional or otherwise, at all. Born in Danbury, Connecticut in 1874, Charles Edward Ives was the son of a musician, one whose tastes and inclinations would leave their impression on his son for the rest of his life. This was George Ives, who had been one of the finest bandmasters of the Union Army during the Civil War, as well as its youngest. And while George was himself no composer, he was much possessed by the kind of musical curiosity and experimentation that would define his son's compositional aesthetic. And he was also a lover of vernacular music, from Stephen Foster to the American hymnal. Stories of Charles' childhood bear the mark of this peculiarly vibrant upbringing. We hear of the elder Ives' penchant for microtonal experimentation, building his own instruments that could play quarter tones, and of instructing his sons to sing in one key while he accompanied them at the piano in another. Little surprise then that Charles himself fast became a musician a prodigally talented organist. He was playing professionally for a number of churches by the time he was 14. Ives left Danbury to enroll at Yale University in 1894. Here as a music student, he finally collided with the musical conservatism from which his childhood had been so free in the person of his composition professor, Horatio Parker. Parker, was the very model of the European-trained conservative composer that dominated American concert life around the turn of the century. And while Ives must have chafed under his tutelage, one look at one of Ives' experimental pieces was all Parker needed to tell the young man never to show him such things again. He also gained valuable training in traditional harmony, counterpoint, and orchestration. His senior thesis was his Symphony No. 1, an impressive student effort with a decidedly Germanic tint. And it left him at the conclusion of his collegiate studies with a challenge. Was he to pursue the career of a musician, which meant traveling to Europe and submitting to more decidedly un-Ivesian training, or take another alternative route? Well, as it happened, he chose the alternative route. Ives moved to New York City to start working in the insurance business in 1899, keeping up his music on the side, as it were, by composing in his spare time and working as a church organist. It turned out that he was an excellent insurance man. He and a partner in 1907 founded their agency, Ives & Company, which grew to prodigious size. It became at one point the largest agency in the country and afforded Ives and his wife, Harmony, whom he married in 1908, a pleasantly comfortable lifestyle. And all the while Ives composed, his time at Yale, while not spent pursuing his own compositional ideals, must have given him the discipline to work under less than ideal circumstances. Between 1907 and 1918, he produced some of his finest and best known works, such as Three Places in New England, The Concord Sonata, and the better part of Symphony No. 4. These were alternately wild and complex, beautiful and erudite, reflecting Ives' stylistic thumbprints, 
noisy, jagged layers of seemingly conflicting meters and keys, heavy use of musical quotation, and adherence to purely American forms and styles. Unsurprisingly, the few musicians who saw Ives work during this time found them too bizarre, too difficult, too altogether foreign to view as anything but freakish anomalies. It was not until the 1920s and 30s that a courageous few, among them Henry Cowell and Aaron Copland, began to recognize Ives' rare and unique gift. Ironically, by then, Ives had largely ceased composing, owing to a series of heart attacks which culminated in his retirement from insurance in 1927. Ives lived until 1954, and while he continued revising his music, attending its sporadic performances, and staying in touch with his few champions, it wasn't until after his death that the public at large began to realize the gifts that had lain under their noses for decades. Such was the price paid by the most original, eclectic, and perhaps greatest composer yet produced by the United States.